Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 309, featuring part two of my interview with the amazing Anthony and Nicola Caulfield, the producers of From Bedrooms to Billions and the upcoming uh, documentary about the Amiga called The Amiga Years. This part of the interview, we focus in on those uh, Amiga years and some of the behind the scenes uh, stuff about the production of that documentary. We get into stuff like the video toaster, uh, what happened at Atari that led to the Amiga, much, much more, and lots more stuff about the UK versus the US game development scene. Much, much more. I'm sure you guys are going to love it. So without further ado, here is Anthony and Nicola Caulfield. Uh, but, you know, one thing that occurred to me, and I was going to run this past, past you two and saw what you thought about this, but, you know, as I'm watching uh, From Bedrooms to Billions, I, I started to think, well, it seems like there was a bit of a lag, you know, te technologically speaking, that, like, the, the, diff uh, the tape drive, for example, stayed relevant for a lot longer. Uh, at least that's the impression I got from the, from, the, from the documentary, right? And I was thinking, you know, on the one hand, that's kind of bad, you know, wouldn't it be great to have the latest, always have the latest uh, hardware available? But on the other hand... You know, like the tape drive, for example, that loading, as it loaded, that was an opportunity for, for music, right? And for people to put their chip tunes in there. And that whole scene flourished on account of that. And also, with the, as long as it was the 8-bit era, uh, there were, you could just type in games from magazines, right? So it seemed like that would have lasted a lot longer. Uh, and then in the U.S., where everything sort of moved so much uh, faster into, those, into an era where you, couldn't, you, couldn't, you didn't really have those low, long loads anymore. You didn't have the code in the magazines. You see, you see what I'm sort of playing with here. You know, this, this yes. is Do you think I'm onto something here, or is this a, <laughs> am I completely off base? <laughs> Not at all. I think it. I think it's that. Um, what's it? Somebody said um, it's that budget type attitude of let's try that. Let's. Do, why are you taking that apart? I don't know. I want to see how it works. Well, I want to see. The, you the know, magazines. I think with the um, typing listings, like very often. They wouldn't work. You'd spend hours doing them. But then you'd think, well, what's gone wrong? So then you'd sit there and go through it. All. And I think that's what got people into it. I think they're a really important part they were huge, of yeah. the industry. I think pretty much everyone <laughs> at some point has sat there trying to do that. And then you hit the run button, it don't work. <laughs> so many of the yeah. sort of what you would consider the pioneers um, oh. across, the, across the world yeah. started off with some form of type in listing. And then with, adjusting it. Yeah, and it they? looked like yeah. jargon. It looked yeah. like, you know, double Dutch. You know, it just made no sense. And then they worked out, if I if I adjust that, that makes the colour flash a different colour. And, oh, if I wonder what happens if I do that, oh, it's crashed. And that this constant sort of almost like, um, um, like a constant uh, ongoing learning process. And, and then it, you then... You, and then it just oh I wonder if I can get my code more func more functional I wonder if I can make it more streamlined I wonder if and how can I get more and more out of the machine yeah. how can I do this how can I do that and I've not how can I cheat <laughs> how can I get my character infinite lives <laughs> and things like well, we, you know, we all did that I think it's also it's like why people do word searches and things like that it's that or it's that constant we some people thrive on constantly having to solve problems and code in itself. By the what the name code, sort of almost means that it's always a problem. It's always something that you can improve or perfect. So maybe it's that quest for perfection or something. I, mm. I don't know. Some programmers said that you know they they'd work nonstop on a piece of code, have a day off, and on that day off, in the back of their brain, they're churning through, and then the next day the answer comes out. They never really they never really switch off. There was a section in the film actually which we cut quite late, which will. We'll hopefully find some some place for it. Mm. Was actually programming techniques, which was where uh, what what we we actually nicknamed it the descent into code, which is where you can't just go oh I'll just do two minutes of coding and then zip off and have mm. a coffee. It's this slow hour maybe so, two hours slow drop into that sort of almost zombie like state where you sort of you're then aware of everything within the within the code. And then a ringing phone ruins everything. You know, phone goes off or something, you know, someone knocks at the door for a package or something. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, then you've then got to descend back into it all over again. And we had a whole chapter which was about a lot of these early stories about how people started to learn to create and, and everything else. But the problem was it was too long. 
and it yeah. and you needed to watch so much of it to understand it. Yeah. So we cut yeah. it in the end. It was just I think it was about thirty five minutes. <laughs> Every section that we put together in from bedrooms ran about an hour. <laughs> As we were doing it, it's like, oh my god! It's like, it literally was. I think the first timeline was about probably about twenty hours. It was like, how are we going to get this down to ninety minutes? Yeah, and we didn't. We didn't know. <laughs> the funny I mean, thing you know, was, somebody who's done some interviews, you know, before. I mean, I have a lot of appreciation for this because I know people that watch this. They probably don't really, you know, realize how much work had to go into each and every just doing the interviews, much less all the editing and deciding what what to keep them. <laughs> yeah. you know, did, did you keep a running tally of how long you actually spent working on this? Do you know what? we? I wish we had, but we yeah. didn't. I mean, I can honestly tell you that some interviews would take three to four hours to research and get ready. We're interviewing Gary Witter tomorrow, um, and it took me four hours today to get his questions written, ready. Um, because there was so much, because he started out, before he started, well, he's not working on the new Star Wars film now, but... Um, he was a very esteemed video games journalist uh, for the Amiga for many years before he um, before he came out to the US. Um, so there's a lot we want to talk to him about because he wrote a lot of articles at the time, and we want to make it a good interview. So you want to you don't just want to ask stock questions. So you you tend to find that you want people to open up and throw the corporate answers out. Um, and we've got a couple of techniques that we've learned over the years to to do that. Um, well, it was it was all. From bedrooms, we always wanted it to be the people telling the, the story. Very early on, we did talk about putting a voiceover in, but then we were like, well, no, because that's kind of our opinion. Mm. That's us driving it, and we didn't feel that that would work. So, And again, with the Amiga years, we're looking to hopefully not have a voiceover in there and have it told by the people. But, of course, doing that sort of approach... It's the editing is incredibly difficult because you have to make sure it's all making sense as it's telling that story. So certainly with the questions that we we put together for people, they have to be thorough, don't yeah. they? It has to be really well researched. Yeah, it does take a lot longer. We quite like the idea that the viewer it it feels unbiased. It feels mm. like your the viewer is taken on a journey by only the people that were in there. That only that only the people that lived through it, and then at the end of it. You know that that's it. They're carried through. It's almost like hands carrying you along. And um, sorry, that sounds a bit arty, doesn't it? But it, and we never sat <laughs> down and thought. That that yeah. Yeah. And we, and we <laughs> never sat down and thought that at the start. It really was. We were going to think. We were thinking voiceover driven. Twenty interviews. Mm -hmm. The problem was was we ran a small Indiegogo cam camp campaign back in 2012, which uh, was very tough. But we did it. Literally with about two days to go. Um, <laughs> and then we started making the film. And it was going to be about you know 80, 90 minutes long. And then as we started shooting interviews, some of those people that we interviewed started tweeting about it and going on Facebook and saying, oh, I just met these two people that are doing a film about the British games industry. And then it started to sort of snowball out. And a lot of people started. And then Retro Gamer emailed us and said, we'd like to do an interview with you about it. And it all started to escalate. And then we started getting a lot of emails from people saying, can we buy a copy? We missed the campaign. Can we, can we do it and anything else? And then as it went on, we thought, well, you know, maybe we should do another campaign. But rather than raise money to to finish the film, because we have to we, we, we have to commit to finishing the film, because otherwise we'll be shortchanging the original Indiegogo backers, um, let's see if we can raise some money for some archive, because the archive is very expensive. It's thousands of pounds a minute. So we thought we can then go to ITV and BBC's video archive and actually research it properly and, and actually license some some complimentary uh, visual footage over it. So we ran a Kickstarter campaign in 2013 which went really well and raised more money than we actually asked for. Um, I think it hit, hit the target in five days out of, yeah. out of 30. Wow. So what we then did is it, I think it finished on around 60, 65, something like that. Um, and um, okay, thousand, sorry. Um, and um, we then basically decided to then open the film out and use the extra money to shoot more interviews. So the film actually was delivered over, a, let me get this right, about 15 months later than we originally said it was going to be. But we did tell our backers that we were going to actually shoot more. So they, they signed up for a 90-minute film, and they all got a two-and-a-half-hour film. So they got an extra hour for no extra money, basically. Mm -hmm. 
I don't so, think anybody complained. No. no one did actually. No, no one, no, no one. I think they would have done if we'd said a two and a half hour film and they got ninety minutes. But you know, so we we sort of we sort of felt that, and we really did try to get it under two. We didn't want it to be over <laughs> we, two hours. We gave up in the end. Though. And the film, the film was continually nine hours long, eight hours long, seven hours long, and we were gradually honing it down over the over the months. Which is not actually the right way. It's not really technically the right way to do it. Funny enough, it's it's a, sort of a backwards way. But the problem was, it was just trying to find the story. We we had so many conflicting opinions and and everything else. And gradually it came down, came down, and we got it to about two hours forty five, and we couldn't get it down anymore. And then we then decided to cut a couple of sections out, and then we got it down to two hours twenty five, and that was it. Yeah. And I think the end credits with all the backer names on the end pushed it back to the, two the hours. The end credits were about forty minutes. <laughs> I think we upped the speed on it just a little bit, didn't we? It's sort of. A... We were just going to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about all the unused footage? Is that on? Is that going to be online somewhere, or maybe on a special super edition set of discs, well, or? It's funny you should say that because um, this looks so set up, set up, doesn't it? But um, this is the this is the um, because what you have there, Matt, is the Kickstarter version of From Bedrooms to Billions. This, if it doesn't, if the light doesn't shine, it's a, it. yes, it might. Yes, that's right. Let's hold it's up. Like back a Blu-ray box. version there. Huh? That, the yeah, Blu-ray. that's the blue. That well, you, there's Blu-ray and this is a DVD. But the cover is different. And this was designed by Paul Carr, who does. Uh, uh, of all people, Quentin Tarantino's artwork, who wow. did Kill Bill, and, and he wrote to us because he's a huge fan of uh, Rob Hubbard and Commodore 64, and he said, can I do anything on the film? And what we'd always said to our backers was that once the film, they'll all get the special Oliver Frey version, the, the, the chap that designed the cover that you have, if you'd like to hold it up one more time, is designed by the magazine artist Oliver Frey. Who drew a lot of all the Zap and Crash covers throughout the 1980s? Very, very popular magazine. You see his little signature down on the down on the uh, left-hand side, bottom left. That's it, Oliver yeah, Frey. Yeah, yeah. And he he basically um, designed that cover for us, and it was only going to be for the Kickstarter backers. Um, and then obviously, once the film was released to all the Kickstarter backers, we needed to make it commercially available to anybody else that wants it. And then Mr. Carr, Paul Carr, came in and designed this cover for us, which still Tilt, looks. Tilt down. Oh, there you go. There we are. It's sort of close <laughs> encounters, slightly close encounters, but there's a, a boy. That's, that, that's, that's, that's actually our son. That's, that's our son, son Thomas, yeah. in front of Matthew Smith's ZX Spectrum. Yeah. Wow. And then wow. some fancy effects and everything else. But that's the that's the commercial cover. If you go on Amazon or um, or anywhere else to buy the film. Um, so people can just uh, buy this from Amazon. Does, does it have to be Amazon UK or is it on the Amazon? Uh, far, it should be Amazon all over, actually. Yeah. Amazon.com. Oh, you can also order it from our website at www.frombedroomstobillions.com. Um, which, uh, which you guys get more money when people buy it from your website? I don't think so. No, it's the same. It's exactly the same, it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It goes through to the, keep the cost. Universal. It goes through the same it's same yeah. fulfillment house anyway, so yeah. it's uh, yeah. But we do have hours and hours of footage, and um, and we are think trying to work out what's the best way of getting it out at the moment. So we thought we're going to shoot the Amiga years, see what we have left from that, because we're going to have hours there as well, and and maybe look at trying to do some sort of special release of it all but we're not quite sure yet how to do that are we're we? tempted by the idea of you see one thing we don't want to do is ever uh, short change the the original from bedrooms to billions mm. backers and do like a sort of from bedrooms to billions direct director's cut or something no. because that would cheapen the uh, the whole thing but one thing we thought about possibly um is like some sort of like almost like episodic version so we can open it out um, and really expand on the chapters and and that's and a lot of people have, have asked asked us about that yeah. and said that because we have the material like a TV for series. It. Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, like the magazines alone could probably be an hour and a half. You know, um, early development on the Spectrum could be another hour and a half. The music for the Commodore music, 64. Yeah. And the thing is, by doing the Amiga years, we're now getting a huge number of um, of overseas developers who are also sharing their childhood. Development stories as well, right the way through before the Amiga. So of Eric course, Chai, we did the yeah, exactly. Time, we've um, we? we just literally have just interviewed Eric Chai, who did Another World, which I believe was called Out of This World, um, out of this world in the US, mm-hmm. and also Paul Kise, who did um, Flashback, um, yeah, which I think is called Quest yeah. for Identity in um, in the US as well. Flashback, Quest for Identity. 
I'm pretty sure I had the uh, European version of that. Yeah. Um, Famous for its forward roll and quick drawing gun action, which is the yeah. But, but they were quite long interviews as well. So. You're doing the whole thing on the video toaster, right? We're gonna be we're gonna be talking about the video toaster. Oh, you see, are we editing it on the video toaster? <laughs> <laughs> We've used, that video, would be pretty video cool. toaster. We have used video toaster. We have used video yeah. toaster actually, yeah. yeah. We've and Lightwave. Yeah, yeah, we we've um we actually one of our earlier edit machines back to over ten years ago was a video, video toaster. toaster yeah. We had four had a couple of video toasters, didn't yeah, we? Yeah. Brilliant machine. Maybe yeah, we fantastic. get to the bottom of this whole Babylon five, you know, because I, I keep hearing that it was used for that and then I hear it wasn't it was. used for yeah. that and I'm like, ah! Was it or was it not? <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was. Yeah. And also it appears Star Trek Voyager as well was um uh, was yeah. some of the special effects on that were created? CGI was created on Amiga's that Amiga Four Thousands and yeah. um, also Sequest, which actually, funny enough, actually, it I, might not have been. Does anybody, Sequest. Does anybody Sequest actually DS know what the yeah, submarine Sequest is? Sequest is another one. I keep hearing that that was a, a video toaster, or light wave as well. It looks like it. Pioneering. Uh, it was very pioneering, um, and um, you know, it was a. Uh, it really, it, it because it effectively brought um, almost like a cheaper solution. Broadcast, yeah, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. I mean, also, yeah, that's the other thing that people forget about the toaster is a lot of toasters, Amiga uh, running with Amigas, were selling in other countries as as effectively television studios in a box. They were able to do multiple camera feeds and multiple OB broadcasts and other things. And nothing else could do it. Certainly not on a portable computer. Well, we, was... we used them. We we did a couple of events many years ago, and we used video toasters for that yeah. as well. So, yeah. Do you know? I forgot that. Ah, oh, there you go. There's a book. I think it's uh, called "The Future Was Here." Have you seen that one? No. I'm pretty sure that's the title. It's out of. Uh, I can't remember the author's name, but I remember he's got a chapter in there there about the video toaster. It's all about the Amiga. Yeah. He's got a chapter uh -huh. about the video toaster. Apparently, there was some something about the design of the hardware that made it, you know, they made it sort of uniquely suited for something like the toaster. I don't know enough about the technical stuff to, you know, give well, you that, that part of it. But we're in that at the moment. We're actually we've just done we've just done we've just interviewed half of the original hardware and software team for the Amiga, and that was the difference you see between the Amiga and the Atari ST. Was the the uh, Atari ST. Um, was effectively off-the-shelf components. Now, I, noticed, ST, I noticed it wasn't called the Atari ST years, so I assume you have a preference for the Amiga. Yeah, well, it's well. That's the thing. The Amiga was the um, what we were finding was when we were shooting the original movie. Um, we were finding that uh, developer after developer after developer was saying the same thing, saying, um, "Oh, they were saying that they felt held back by the ST." Um, I know there's a lot of Atari fans out there, but what they don't, what a lot of Atari fans Probably don't quite realize, off comments right now. Exactly what they don't, <laughs> what they don't realize is that the is that, um, well, this is straight. The the Commodore Amiga, take the Commodore away from it completely. The Amiga was an independent design project, predominantly led and originally created by the original Atari hardware team. That were frustrated with the way Atari were running things. Uh, sorry, were frustrated with the way Warner were running Atari. And once the Atari 800 was finished, they wanted to work on a new uh, multitasking computer that would be a fantastic games machine that would work on with the new 68000 chip. And they were told no. So they went fine and they left. And these were the guys that basically created, that worked, created the TIA and the graphics, uh, some of the graphics hardware and all these amazing things on the Atari 2600, the Atari 400 and 800 that allowed games like Star Raiders and other things to, co um, to come around. So we're talking hardcore Atari engineers created the Amiga, mm. whereas the Atari ST was a reaction to the Amiga and was put together in less than a year using off-the-shelf components whereas the Amiga was comp had custom built des custom designed and built chips they were specifically created to go in the Amiga there's a there's a gulf of difference between the ST and the Amiga yeah, there's quite a few of um, the developers that we've interviewed saying they were quite frustrated by the fact that when they were with a publisher the publisher said you have to do the game for the Atari ST as well, and they were like, "Oh, that we we can't, it can't be as good because it, we've got it on the Amiga, weren't they?" So they're getting quite frustrated 
Because that would then get ported to the Amiga and it wasn't quite as good as they wanted. So we didn't call it the 16-bit years, um, this new film, because we, we didn't want to cover the consoles, because the consoles are quite heavily covered in the first film. And also the, the Amiga, the, the ST and the Amiga came out around the same time, so of course they're 16-bit programmable computers. I had an Atari ST and I loved it, but, but the Amiga was the pioneering machine. Because often we found that the that somebody who got an ST first, as soon as they got Amiga, they just left the ST behind. I mean, we will be covering the Atari as well. It will be in there. <laughs> yeah, and we're not yeah. saying the Atari ST is a bad machine or a no. rubbish machine. But no. what we're what we're basically saying is that the is we're telling the story of how the Amiga came about. That's a great story. How the Amiga was created. Why these guys left Atari. And there's a little bit of Apple in there as well. You'll find out. Which yes. we didn't realise until we yeah. discovered it. A little bit of the Mac in there, just a just a snifter of the Apple. A snifter of snifter of Mac. <laughs> Steve Jobs had a rant, didn't he? A huge yeah. rant, punching the desk, yeah. and said, "I don't want any colour in the Mac. It's going to be monochrome. I don't want any yeah. games. I don't want anything That's else." That's what I edited so the, the other day. So Ron yeah. went, "Fine, I'll take these and take these over to this other project over yeah. here. They are much more exciting." Yeah. There you go. Sorry, we got carried away there. Yeah. <laughs> And that's all for this week's episode. I should be back next week with part three <laughs> of my interview with uh, Anthony Nicola. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Anthony Nicola Caulfield. We've got a lot more stuff to cover, so stay tuned for that. I'm also thinking about reaching out to them for an update because I think they have some exciting news about the Amiga years. So uh, hopefully there will be a little bit of an updated segment in there as well. As always, I want to thank you, 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 thank you for supporting Matt Chat. You guys are completely awesome. If you would like to step up to the plate yourself, just go to that little handy dandy link in the show notes to my Patreon site, where you can support the show at any cost or at any amount that you prefer. A dollar a show is all I ask. So thank you very, very much. Now, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> All right, so not a whole lot of news this week. Actually, uh, as you're watching this, I am probably... Uh, with my in-laws, hopefully, <laughs> at least that's the plan. Uh, barring some kind of disaster, I will be there. Uh, so this is actually, I'm actually pre-recording this a few days in advance, so there won't be another uh, long delay. I know you guys uh, hate that. But anyway, there is some news. Uh, first of all, someone has recreated Ocarina of Time in Unreal Engine, or Unreal 4. Yeah, Unreal Engine 4, I guess. It's not the whole game, it's just the, the village Kakrinko, uh, Kakariko... <laughs> You know, I never actually tried to pronounce that before. Uh, anyway, that little village, and it looks pretty awesome. Uh, I thought you guys would get a kick out of that. Uh, also, uh, let's see what else I have uh, on here. Oh, uh, I got an awesome package. I mean, this is an awesome box from Masochus. Uh, he sent me the uh, Dar a Dark Sun game, Arx Fatalis, some, some Star Trek stuff, a cool calendar. And also, and this is really, really awesome, uh, this... Dagger. This is the uh, so this dagger is called the Hegenitor's Jabber. And he's got he's got a I don't know if he came up with this all himself or what, but it's it's pretty awesome stuff. <laughs> so apparently it has a uh, two abilities: Rat Bash, 800% uh, damage on any rodent, has a chance to proc 2,500 damage on any unopened package <laughs> or mail, and another ability called uh, Mop Your Ass Up, instantly casts death. Cannot be resisted on all monsters when Lord British or Matt Barton are in the party <laughs> slash group. Uh, so this is just above and beyond. You know, I've never you know, gotten anything like this before. It's, it's actually a pretty cool uh, weapon. Looks beautiful. So what's really cool is actually now I, that I have uh, two daggers, I can actually dual wield. Oh, yeah. Yes, I can stab and thrust and, and swing and, and just in general look like a, an idiot. Uh, but nevertheless a very potentially dangerous, if to myself, idiot. So, thank you very much, Masochus. You know what else Masochus sent me? 
Now this is probably the worst combination in the world to send the guy a uh, janitor's jabber and in the same package send him a, a rather large ale. Uh, I don't know if the guy's uh, if the guy likes me or just uh, wants me to die. Uh, this is Krabby's Spiced Orange uh, Alcoholic Ginger Beer. Uh, best served over chilled over ice with a slice of orange. Well, it's going into the drinking horn. Uh, let's see, it's uh, anything else here? Where's this brewed from? Krabby's sounds kind of British to me. Let's see, bottled by. Wilson Road, United Kingdom. <laughs> Got it correct. Let's see, Everett, something about imported into Everett, Massachusetts. Okay, for more than 200 years. <laughs> wow. Uh, Krabby's has shipped its ginger from the Far East following the pioneering footsteps of the first Scots merchants adventures, hence our distinctive, uh, distinctive elephant trademark. Uh, so that's some pretty uh, deep roots for you. Uh, following a secret recipe the steep ginger is matured for eight weeks. It's then combined with a real orange extract, giving a deliciously distinctive flavor. Now it's a 4.8% alcohol, so hopefully that's uh, uh, that, that won't that shouldn't be too bad, especially since I have a five o'clock uh, wake up call tomorrow. But anyway, I'm really excited about. It. I love ginger beer. I like. I'm, I'm intrigued by the orange. I haven't uh, tried that before. I really no idea uh, what it's going to be like. So uh, let's just get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Krabby's uh, Spiced Orange Alcoholic Ginger Beer. Ah, in the rather excellent drinking horn. And, you know, it smells like one of my favorite drinks. You ever had those uh, orange Alka-Seltzers? You know, the, <laughs> the cold medicine? You think I'm uh, joking around, but that's actually quite tasty. No, I'm just joking around. This is actually a very, uh, very uh, nice aroma on this. You get kind of a, you definitely smell that orange extract they were talking about. I'm not really smelling uh, the ginger though. I guess the uh, maybe the orange is kind of uh, overshadowing that. But you know, it smells really good. Kind of reminds me of an uh, orange uh, Mountain Dew, or uh, maybe one of those. Uh, uh, yeah, that, I think that's about a. That's about as good as I can do with this. About a kind of an orangey Mountain Dew flavor. Uh, smells good. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Let's give it another taste. Uh, you know, I don't... There is a lot of uh, flavors going on here. I'm going to have to try this one more time, just to try to get a handle on this. Okay, what am I tasting there? You can definitely, it's, it's very spicy. It's almost like an orange rind-like uh, level on that. Uh, you taste it, the ginger. It's, it's, you kinda, I guess what I'm tasting here is the heat of that ginger uh, and that sort of sweet orange uh, and that little bit of a bitter uh, orange rind-like flavor. It's actually a very... A complex uh, flavor on this. Uh, it probably wouldn't be uh, up, you know, everybody's favorite by any means, but I think it's actually quite interesting. Uh, let me try it again here. It just, uh, you know, I don't know what to, I've never tasted anything like this before. <laughs> I was kind of expecting kind of an orange Mountain Dew flavor. Uh, instead, it's, it's kind of more like a, uh, almost like a grapefruit uh, with some, uh, ginger and the uh, that orange flavor almost a bit of a and then you sort of get that heat from the ginger just a lot of stuff going on here totally exotic <laughs> set of flavors here uh wow you know i don't know what to compare this to even uh, I, I like it though you know i could easily see drinking uh you know getting this on a regular occasion if it were available here uh, so i'm going to go four out of five drinking horns on it uh, really interesting exotic if you like uh, ginger beer if you like orange flavor uh, if you like the sort of heat uh, from that ginger, I think you'd really uh, like this. Uh, so four out of five drinking horns, and, and thanks again, Masochus. Uh, this is quite nice, and thank you very, very much for your very generous uh, gift. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And, uh, you know, Yogi Berra just passed away today. Uh, so I, I was looking for quotes by him to kind of celebrate his memory. And I found a really good one that I think is uh, very applicable uh, for us here. It goes something like this. 
In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. <laughs> See you guys next week. You stupid bastard, you've got no arms left. Yes, I have. Look, it's just a flesh wound.